Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. Let's hear about this episode's topic. Hello, Dr. Dean and Dr. Lena. Ever since the pandemic hit, my teen daughter has been really anxious, consistently saying she thinks I and our other family members are going to die and has been diagnosing herself with various illnesses. She even had a panic attack. Is this normal behavior given the current situation? When should I worry? This is making me anxious. Thank you. So this is a great question. I think that anxiety is common and so challenging in the teen age group. Mm -hmm. It's really important. And um, I thought we already talked about anxiety in a previous episode. You have a good memory. It was one of our first episodes, but that podcast was on separation anxiety in younger children. And in today's episode, we're going to focus on anxiety in teens. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I do remember learning um, during that episode that anxiety disorders are the most commonly diagnosed mental health condition in childhood. That's right. Based on data from the National Institute of Mental Health, an estimated 32% of adolescents aged 13 to 18 have an anxiety disorder. And given the current climate with the global pandemic, many teens are having a harder time with this. I think we all are, but (laughs) let's go into the details. Um, So are females and males diagnosed with anxiety at the same rates? That's a great question. Um, Actually, females, although we have a lot of strong qualities, we do make up a larger percentage of teenagers and adults diagnosed with anxiety disorders. Specifically in teens, females make up 38% versus just 26% of males. Okay, so clearly this is a big problem that seems to affect women more than men, but both women and men. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that we should talk about, uh, about anxiety, similar to how we addressed um, depression and starting off with identifying anxiety and then discussing the diagnosis and treatment and then the long term management. When discussing anxiety disorders, it's important to mention that there are many different subtypes of anxiety disorders. So like you mentioned, there's separation anxiety, which is more common in younger kids. The most common types in adolescents are social anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorders, and then there's specific phobias. Okay, so today we're going to focus our discussion on generalized anxiety and panic disorder. There's other anxiety subtypes and disorders such as obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and then specific phobias are related, but we're not going to get into those today. Right. Too much to squeeze into our 20-minute podcast. It gives me anxiety just thinking about it. (laughs) But back to identification. So how might a teen or parent notice that they are struggling with anxiety? So I think all of us get anxious. We all have some anxiety every now and then, right? Right. That's a great point. So it's important to remember that in many cases, anxiety can be helpful or even adaptive for us. For example, it gives us motivation to practice for that upcoming presentation or study for a test. All of us experience anxiety and many people have maybe even experienced a panic attack. But it's when that state of hyper arousal is always on and it impacts our day to day functioning, that is when it might be classified as an anxiety disorder. Then, what are some of the signs that may point to anxiety that's interfering with normal functioning for day to day life? Yeah, so some of these symptoms are the same that we discussed in our depression episode, um, including trouble sleeping or concentrating, and this time because of continuous worrying or just feeling like your mind is racing. Or sometimes this manifests as physical complaints like stomach ache or headache or numbness or pain or feeling like your heart is racing. 
Things that are more unique to anxiety specifically includes a fear of leaving home, fear of social situations that might prevent a teenager from hanging out with friends or doing normal teen activities, school refusal or recurring fears about dying or specific parts of what we consider to be a normal routine, like driving, for example. Mm -hmm. Or having a panic attack. Right. Panic attacks can be so frightening for a teen and their parent and anyone else that experiences them. Can you describe for the listeners what a panic attack might look like for a teenager? Yeah, so many people experience this differently, but you may have tightness of your chest, sweating. Um, You might have tremors, dizziness, feel like your heart is racing, which some people experience Um, abdominal cramps, and may even throw up or have diarrhea, too. So many people think they're going to die or that they're having something like a heart attack or a stroke. Right. And these symptoms are very real and very scary for the person that's having them. Specifically, in anxiety disorders, teens typically have this what we call what-if anxiety. For example, if I speak out in class, what if I say the wrong thing? And what if everyone starts laughing at me? They ruminate or play these anticipated negative events over and over in their mind. And then this can lead to avoiding these anxiety-provoking events or anxiety-triggering situations. Um, For in this example, if they have that fear of speaking out in school, they may want to avoid going to school. Right. And then this creates a cycle of maladaptive thoughts and feelings, and this will often perpetuate the avoidant behaviors in order to reduce these uncomfortable feelings. And that's when you know that there's something more going on than routine intermittent anxiety. Mm -hmm, Definitely. So now parents might be thinking, well, how would we get a diagnosis? So if your teen experiences significant anxiety, um, it's important to start by, again, bringing your concerns to your physician or a mental health professional. So your physician may give you some standardized questionnaires to better help determine the severity and type of anxiety. One of these questionnaires you may see in the office is called the GAD-7, short for Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7 Item Scale. So as you may have guessed, it has seven questions. And based on your score, your physician can help categorize anxiety as mild, moderate, or severe. So again, this looks at over the last two weeks, it says, how often have you been bothered by the following problems? Not at all, several days, over half of the days, or nearly every day. And it includes questions like feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, trouble relaxing, becoming easily annoyed or irritable, or feeling afraid that something awful might happen. So this questionnaire is useful for diagnosing generalized anxiety only, right? That's right. So there are other assessments that your physician may administer that look at other subtypes. For example, one's called the SCARED, which is an appropriate name. Um, Screening for Childhood Anxiety-Related Disorders is what it is short for. Um, And this can be, there's two, usually one's filled out by the child or teen and one by the parent. And it can look at different things like generalized anxiety, as well as panic disorder, separation anxiety, and social anxiety. And some of the questions on there might say something like, I have nightmares about something bad happening to my parents. I worry about going to school. When I get frightened, my heart beats really fast. So those are some of the questions you might see on that. And similar to all other mental health disorders, a diagnosis is officially made based on the DSM-5 criteria, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And they have really specific criteria, and they, they really help us to Um, assess for anxiety. Yeah, so I can help take us through the DSM criteria for generalized anxiety. So that includes excessive anxiety and worry occurring more days than not for at least six months and occurring about a number of activities. And the person is finding it difficult to control the worry. And the anxiety is usually associated with one of these other symptoms. This is sort of interesting because In adults, you need three of these symptoms, but in kids, we actually just need one. So that can be restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge, being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbance. 
And then again, that there's not another diagnosis that better explains their symptoms. So for example, we talked about PTSD or anorexia or OCD, um, that there's not another disorder or substance use that could explain the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So that was a good review of generalized anxiety disorder. And then I can talk about the criteria for panic attacks and panic disorder. So for panic attacks, it's a discrete period of intense fear or discomfort in which four or more of the following symptoms develop abruptly and reach a peak within 10 minutes. And the symptoms include palpitations or pounding heart, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensation of shortness of breath or being smothered, a feeling of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal pain, dizziness, unsteadiness or being lightheaded or faint, um, derealization or depersonalization, fear of losing control or going crazy, fear of dying, numbness or tingling, chills or hot flashes. And then uh, separately for panic disorders, a person must have recurrent and unexpected panic attacks greater than equal to one or more attack has been followed by one month or more of one or both of the following being persistent concern about additional attacks or their consequences um, or a significant maladaptive change in behavior related to the attack. So we're going to quiz we're going to quiz everybody on this afterwards, right? Right. Well, I think that the most important distinction is that the the panic attack, there's that list of criteria that need to be there. And then for the panic disorder, you have, have had an attack and then you're really worried about having another one and it's persisting. It changes your behavior. You're, you're ruminating. You're thinking about it all the time. And so you're avoiding things that you think might trigger an attack to kind of um, summarize it. So they're They're clear diagnostic criteria, but obviously you as a parent are not responsible for knowing them. That's why we went to medical school. Um, But it's just important to keep in mind. And it's also important to keep in mind that these anxiety disorders sometimes occur in isolation, but they also commonly occur associated with other mental health conditions like depression in teenagers. So what happens when a teen meets the criteria for the diagnosis of generalized anxiety or panic disorder? What's the treatment? Is it medication, medication plus therapy, therapy alone? Where, which direction do you go into? They're all great questions. The first step is educating the teen and the parent about anxiety. So discuss how avoidance results in actually worse symptoms with each exposure. And that while if you persist through anxiety, in the future, you're going to have a lower level of symptoms of anxiety with each future exposure. Sometimes drawing this out and kind of documenting it for families, illustrating the connection between thoughts and feelings and their behaviors can be helpful. And then the next step is working with the teen and the parent to coach them to replace their maladaptive thoughts and behaviors. And for parents, you want to work to recognize and track your own behaviors that may be accommodating the the teen to maintain your teen's avoidant behaviors. So, for example, if you allow the child to stay home when they have a stomach ache before a big test, it just sort of reinforces that this is like a, a good strategy. In teenagers and really adults for that matter, the hallmark of anxiety treatment is therapy, but it's specifically CBT. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And CBT works to teach the child to replace unrealistic negative thinking with more realistic thoughts. Um, For example, changing the if I'm going to die if I say the wrong answer to I will feel embarrassed. My body might feel that tension and may be uncomfortable, but I'm going to be okay. So you want to recognize the link between your physical symptoms and your emotional state and then work to change those behaviors by gradual exposures. So what does a session of cognitive behavioral therapy look like and how long does it last? In teenagers with anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy is usually weekly for about 10 to 12 weeks of course, depending on the specific individual. Appointments last about 50 minutes to an hour. And in the beginning of the session, you'll review homework that was assigned the previous week. So I think this is really important. And one of the things that uh, psychiatrists that I work with 
told me to see if a person is actually getting CBT is, does your therapist give you homework? It's important to remember that you still have to put in some work when you're not at the office. And then you're going to work to introduce new skills to help reduce anxiety, such as relaxation techniques and cognitive coping skills. Okay, so that sounds great. And it's really kind of a surprise to me that the therapy only lasts two to three months. Right. I mean, it's it's very easy to teach yourself. Well, not very easy. It requires work. But you really only need that amount of time to teach these skills to reframe your anxious thoughts and behaviors. And that's not to say that a lot of individuals benefit from continuing therapy, but they may go on to more of a, a talk therapy. They might not need this intense CBT. So one of the challenges is finding a therapist that does cognitive behavioral therapy with teens, and they're not always available. And if they are available, they might not match up with your medical insurance. So is there, are there like online exercises that can teach the same principles as as CBT? You know, what about like an app or anything? Are, Are those available? Yeah, it's a great point. I think that obviously having um, an experienced professional is probably the optimal choice, but there are a lot of great exercises and workbooks that you can find online. And we have posted the links on our website to some of those workbooks. And for apps, you know, we all have our phones on us. There's some really good apps that help teach mindfulness and coping strategies um, that can be used in addition to supplement therapy. So I've specifically used programs like Headspace or Calm or MindShift, and I really like all of them. They're a nice um, way to break away if I'm feeling anxiety or feeling like I can't focus because my mind is racing. And so we can post um, all of those on our website as well. Okay. So it sounds like they're more supplements rather than really primary therapy. Right. Okay. So right now we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And so a lot of therapy is moving online over video chat or via telephone rather than in person. There's one study that was published recently in the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry, and it showed that for adults with health-related anxiety, that internet or video-based cognitive behavioral therapy was as effective at reducing symptoms as face-to-face therapy. Yeah, I saw that. And it's really nice to hear because you think that it may be promising for teens as well. And it might be great for people that live in an area where they might not have a therapist or have access to CBT. Um, So in talking to some of the therapists that I work with and trust, they say that it does seem like virtual therapy is helpful, but it seems to be harder in younger kids. So today we're talking about teens and obviously they're digital natives, they're experts with this. But for kids um, who are less, eight years of age or less, it seems to be harder for that age group. And so maybe the in-person will be better for those younger kids. Yeah. So the in-person for the younger kids, but nice to have the option for the older kids. I'm especially thinking of like kids who are in rural areas where they're just may not be um, anybody available um, in those areas. So this this could be an option. Definitely. So um, in addition to therapy, there can be a role for medications. Um, In children, the medication of choice in anxiety is an SSRI. And again, that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. We talked a little bit more about this in our episode on teen depression. So tune in there for more specifics on SSRIs. But the two FDA-approved medications for use in kids are fluoxetine or Prozac and escitalopram or Lexapro. But there's a lot of other meds that have been studied and have been shown to be safely used in kids. Um, So some parents also may ask about a medication known as a benzodiazepine, which are sometimes used for generalized anxiety or panic disorder, usually in adults. And we don't recommend these in children. So you may recognize the names of benzodiazepines such as Ativan or Lorazepam or Xanax, um, also known as Alprazolam. I have to have to to say I have a little bit difficulty with those names because I don't (laughs) don't use these drugs um, in my practice. As an infectious disease specialist, yeah. And I don't either as a pediatrician. I've never prescribed one of these because they're really not safe in kids. But many adults take them and they take them before like a long flight if they have um, fear of flying, for example. 
The reason that we don't recommend them in teenagers is because these medications can be addictive and they do have dangerous side effects. So, for example, if they're ever combined with alcohol or something like that, they are both depressants. So you have probably heard of people dying from the combination of these two. And then not just those big side effects and the addictive properties, but really it's essentially just putting a temporary Band-Aid on a larger problem. So if you don't learn to reframe those anxieties, then it's not going to help the child in the long term. So they may not never be used, for example, to help a panic attack or on a very as-needed um, basis, but they're definitely not considered first-line management in the treatment of anxiety in teenagers. And once you've started treatment with therapy and or medications, um, it's continued process of reinforcing your positive thoughts and reframing the anxious and maladaptive thoughts. Right. Through therapy and hard work, you can definitely lessen anxiety and, you know, improve your day to day functioning and sleep and so many different things. So that wraps up today's episode of Kids Considered on Teen Anxiety, specifically Generalized Anxiety Disorder and Panic Disorder. And so we want to summarize that anxiety disorders are the most common mental health condition diagnosed in teenagers. Some symptoms of anxiety disorders include trouble focusing and or sleep issues, constant worrying, physical symptoms like heart palpitations, chest tightness, abdominal pain, or even panic attacks. Anxiety may occur with depression or other mental health diagnoses or occur independently. Treatment includes therapy, the most effective of which is cognitive behavioral therapy, and at times medications are also used. And if you or your child is struggling with anxiety, please reach out to your physician or mental health provider. We would like to thank Dr. Don Blacker, a psychologist at the UC Davis Care Center, for reviewing today's episode, although Dr. Dean and I take full responsibility for any errors or misinformation. So getting back to the caller whose daughter is having some concerns about family members dying and some um, somatic or like physical complaints about her own body. It does sound a lot like anxiety. Um, and I think it's always challenging right now in August of 2020, where um, all faced with the fear of coronavirus and being surrounded in media all the time. And so I, it's definitely important to acknowledge and listen to her feelings and um, possibly enroll look for a therapist that may be able to restructure and reframe some of these negative thoughts and things that she has her anxieties around. Yeah, it sounds like she could really benefit from that kind of therapy. Definitely. And um, I think it's also important, especially right now, but depending on what your child's fears and anxieties are, is to remember that you know, while we're all consumed by news, it's important to turn off the news sometimes and minimize exposure, which can really worsen the anxiety in some of our teenagers. Not that you have to shield them from what's going on in the world, but um, you also don't need to have it on constantly in the background. <laughs> I, you know, personally have struggled with anxiety. I think the physician um, type A personality tends to have a little bit, be a little bit more on the anxious side. I've had one panic attack in my life. And yeah, have you had any? No, I mean, I've been anxious about stuff, but I don't think I've had a, an actual panic attack. Well, I, act, I don't know if I've had a real full panic attack that would meet all of those criteria, but I was one time studying late for the MCAT, which is the test that you take before applying to medical school. And my heart started beating fast and then half of my body went numb. And so I actually went to the emergency room with my roommate at the time thinking I was having a stroke or something like that. And they did a CT scan of my head and then they're like, no, I think you're having anxiety. And I was like, wow, this that's like a very scary feeling to have. And, you know, it went away and nothing like that's ever happened before, but you definitely as a person feel like, oh my gosh, I am going crazy or, or something big is happening to me. Those are scary symptoms. So it's not something that we expect parents or um, teens to just deal with on their own. You should 
definitely seek out your provider. So it's not something where like if you're having chest pain or shortness of breath or chest tightness, we don't want you to stay at home and just wait it out thinking that it's anxiety. You should definitely be seen. But um, those are one of the the big symptoms of a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking the closest I might have come was you know, a couple of years ago, I went to um, to Africa, to Liberia mm -hmm, to I remember. work on um, Ebola vaccine. And I remember being very nervous about it. I'd never been there. I wasn't sure what it would be like. And I wasn't sure about the security and what to do after we landed at the airport. And would somebody be there to meet me? And how would I recognize them? And I remember being in the Atlanta airport, um, waiting for a connection on the way there and thinking, what am I doing? What am I doing <laughs> going to like Africa? And, you know, am I qualified? And having all sorts of insecurity about it and and I remember having stomach aches and calling my wife like constantly. I was like calling her and, and, and saying, you know, Mary Beth, what am I doing here? And I don't feel good and I'm not sure. And then like I'd hang up and then like 10 minutes later call her again, Mary Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. everything went, went, went very smoothly and it was really a wonderful experience and everything went fine and I was secure and all that. But I remember just that the anxiety beforehand was a lot. Yeah. So it just, you know, reinforces that these are pretty normal thoughts and feelings to have. But um, if you feel like it is affecting your teen's day to day functioning, that it's really, really important um, to listen to them, to take their feelings into account and to seek help from a, a professional. That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital. 